Well, I did a workshop at the beginning of this month, um, in May this year, on that very subject of the connection between Michael Chekhov and Shakespeare. So I guess the, the real question is to ask, how can the, um, the method of Michael Chekhov, the approach of Michael Chekhov, um, connect to Shakespeare? What, what can Chekhov say about Shakespeare? And how can that approach to acting really inform us um, the way to do Shakespeare, how to build a character, how to look at a text? I think before we ask that question, what's the connection, we must really ask the question that every play is a script. A musician has notes and music and, for example, Bach, all he has is the, is, is the score, the notes, the music, and he has to read those. With Shakespeare, we have only the text. The musician is in a much better situation because he has an instrument that's objective and outside him and he doesn't use it every day. We use this physical instrument every day for doing all sorts of things, for speaking normally, for eating, for abusing it, for doing all sorts of things. Whereas the musician at the end of the performance or the end of his practice wraps up the violin in a piece of silk and puts it into his lovely case and closes the lid and goes about with his normal day and his normal work. That's not the same with the actor. We use the instrument, the body and the voice. In fact, we could say the human being is a voice instrument and a movement instrument. And that's the great dilemma for the actor, particularly with Shakespeare. So if we just look at the text, and with Shakespeare, there's so much baggage. There's a whole history, particularly from the 20th century, in film and stage performances, all the great actors, all the great film performances. Um, so that's a baggage that we have. And we feel that we want to interpret particular, particularly modern, well, not so modern, they've been interpreting Shakespeare for the last 30, 40 years, possibly and they've been putting it into all sorts of different situations, modern dress, um, setting it in different periods. Um, I saw a film of Richard III where they set it in um, the 30s. Now this is absolutely fine, but I, and you can do anything that you wish, if it's artistic. But the most important thing is not, not to allow that, the interpretation, to get in the way of playing the music, can I say that? I mean, from a musician's point of view, it would be like saying, they've always done Beethoven the same way. It's not relevant today. So we'll put the first violins in clown costumes, the brass in gorilla costumes, and um, the uh, percussion instruments will all be um, dressed like um, fairies or something. That would make no difference to how the to how the music is played, not at all. But we seem to make that mistake with Shakespeare. So when we look at the text, the text will tell us everything. So the question is how to read. And I believe we don't know how to read. We were taught to read. And I believe that's not the same way we should be reading when we read a text, particularly a classical text and particularly Shakespeare. So the question is, what is this new method of reading? So if we're going to talk about Shakespeare and we're going to talk about she uh, uh, Chekhov, we have to look at that very fundamental thing. How do we read a text? Not how do we interpret it or how we act it, but how we read the text. And the method of reading um, is quite different if we're to do it artistically. And what does that mean? So we have the text, for example, and we start to read it. So we look at it and we read the words. Whereas in fact, artistically reading, if I can call it artistic reading, I don't think maybe that's the right term. Maybe it's receiving reading. We read to receive the words. So our eye goes to the paper, it looks at the words, and then we start to read and we start to talk and we start to read the text. However, there's another process we have to do before we open our mouth or before we even start to think about what it means. And that is, our eye goes there, 
that's the movement. And now what does the eye do? It catches the words and brings them into us. In fact, we receive the words and we allow those words to have an impression upon us. It is rather like the whole um, check-off approach of receiving something first. I mean, we, we practice that faculty um, in a lot of the Chekhov work, but what springs to mind at the moment as an example is the improvisation work. Yes, that we just don't blabber and open our mouth, but we receive, we listen, and listening is not just with the ears. We have to listen with our eyes as well. That sounds stupid to listen with our eyes, doesn't it really? But don't get in the way. Actually receive it. Maybe the word is receiving something. Like we receive the sound. We receive the smell. We receive the touch if someone touches us. We receive our own touch as well. What does that feel like if I did that to myself? I receive something. I feel that that's quite quite violent in a way that I want to hurt myself. Whereas if I just do that, I'm receiving something and my whole soul life, my inner life, my psychology moves with that. So I haven't moved my psychology first, like I haven't tried to feel something first, but I've received something first. This is the essence of Chekhov. Anything else is um, superficial and skirting around the real issue. That is we have to receive something. Something has to drop in. And in improvisation, something drops in and then we speak it. We play it out. The same with reading. When we look at a text, we receive it and it will tell us something. So that's very radical. We're not interpreting. The text is telling us something. As an example, I give, I take the first scene from Macbeth to practice this new way of reading, this radical reading or this receiving reading. Don't even like those terms. The new reading. And I take the first scene of Macbeth and we look at it from a point of view as if we've never actually, and we don't know what this play is about. Macbeth, what's Macbeth? I don't know. Nothing in the past that we've known about that play should come into it. We see act one, scene one, so we know it's the beginning, and there's three characters that are appear, that, that are actually, that, ha, that, that are there. They don't come in, they are there. And they're numbered one, two, and three, and they're called witches. First witch, second witch, third witch. Now already, as soon as I say witch, I think I know what a witch is. But let's say that we don't. Let's say it's this wonderful clear slate, the blank page, you don't know what a witch is. The first line is, when shall we three meet again? In second line, in thunder, lightning, or in rain. Don't even go to the second line, look at the first one. We don't know what a witch is. We, we won't impose anything upon it. The word witch, we don't know what a witch is. Who knows? Could be a monkey, could be an animal, could be a leaf. But they talk, but okay. In art, flowers can talk, stones can talk. So we don't know what a witch is. When shall we three meet again? So there's three of them. They've met. They're at the end of their meeting, and they're going to meet again. Okay, so we could say, it's a question. She doesn't know. When shall we three meet again? And it's... The second line is another question, in thunder, lightning, or in rain. Why should people meet? You can meet at a cafe, or in someone's room, or in a church. Where you meet, the location of the meet, will in a way determine what you're meeting about. So we could say, in thunder, lightning, oh, they're weather people, they're meteor meteorologists, they're going to have their instruments and go out and that's why they're meeting. That's fine. And as you go on through that scene, all the information will be revealed to you. And then it'll actually, it will tell you what a witch is. 
rather than thinking, oh God, this is corny, which is uh, Walt Disney. Let's not, not do it like that. Uh, let's do them like something like robots or computers. When shall we three meet again or whatever? This is imposing upon us and you haven't actually learned to read. So when we come to Shakespeare, that is the most important thing to do. And I believe that exercise on the new way of reading is the most important thing. When it begins to tell you what to do, something is stirring inside you already. And that we could say is an imagination, or it could even be the essence of a psychological gesture, or the essence of an atmosphere. It just drops in, it's a little tickle in that sense, and we're not imposing. So say, for example, um, I'm going back to that first scene from Macbeth now, and I'm looking at the last two lines that they all say, uh, hover, uh, fair is foul, and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. Now, if we really look at that and don't impose anything, fair, is foul. Uh, I mean, who would say that? So, what is good is actually bad. And then they turn it around, but what is bad is good. So, who, who would ever say that? Who would ever say, what is good is actually evil? And you have to be very careful in this world, because those things which are dressed up as good are really evil. But then they turn it around and say, but what is evil is also good. So we're not in duality anymore. We're in another dimension, out of duality, out of good, bad, light, dark, earth, spirit, whatever, material, um, non-material things. So this gives us an immediate indication. And as, as I'm talking about it, I'm beginning to see and feel, I don't like that, that they're actually not human. Or if they're human, I don't think I like them. Maybe like doesn't come into it, but I I have a feeling of uh oh fair is foul. Already said something's happening within me. And foul is Next line, hover. Already something's beginning to happen within me. I'm getting this sort of like a note, a sounding which is not in harmony. Hmm? That is not of, of this natural kingdom. By natural kingdom, I mean of nature in harmony that's pure. Something's come into it that has distorted it. I get distortion. And already that's building up within me, and then I can work with that. So that is the actual um, uh, the way of reading. For the actor, it creates many, many possibilities. What it does, the actor doesn't feel a tremendous burden to do something, mm -hmm. F to actually create a character um, that is actually first up, that he's listened and something moves within him, something drops in, he's receiving it, yes? And when something drops in, you'll notice there's a movement inside your psychology, in your soul life, in your, your inner life, in your number two, as we've called it. And that then you can express outwardly through gesture, through your physical instrument, your number one that we've called it. So we get this immediate connection between one and two. Work with that, play with it to begin with and see where it goes. It may develop into something quite, quite different, but that will be quite, that, that process, that movement through will be quite organic. And don't bring the intellect in and say, oh no, that's not the right, it can't be right, uh, Hamlet wouldn't do that. So just go with that. And you'll notice that Hamlet begins to, to tell you 
but not in an intellectual way and not necessarily to begin with in an imaginative way. If we look at the imaginative um, way of building a character, we actually ask Hamlet to come in and show us, like on our own movie screen, how he'd sit down, how he'd talk, how he'd pick up a chair, how he'd put his coat on. I don't necessarily mean before it gets to that image stage, but it's the first little tickle and run with that, work with it, and you'll notice the essence of the text will begin to inform you. Because after all, it is Hamlet who's speaking these words, if you're, if you're looking at Hamlet. Now I am alone. Hamlet says that, no one else. And you've got to get to the essence of that. And then the next line from that soliloquy is, Oh, it's not, oh, mm, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? It's oh, which is an, an expression of the soul life. Oh. Now, I'm not saying you play it like that, but you get the sense of a breathing in and oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I and already just by coming into the essence of that rogue play with the words now oh what a pretty maid am I oh what a silly clown am I it's all very different something happens to me inwardly when I say when I really receive those lines otherwise Oh, what a pretty maid am I? Oh, what a silly clown am I? Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? You're not listening. You're not. And what, and what do I mean by listening? I don't mean listening, hearing. I mean listening to the essence of the text itself. That then can, can help the actor tremendously because what happens then, you get inside the essence. You're already beginning to feel what it's like Hamlet speaking these words. They're Hamlet's words. And what is Shakespeare's advice <laughs> to the actor? It couldn't be better. What does he say? Speak the speech, I pray you, trippingly on the tongue. That doesn't mean trippingly on the tongue or precisely on the tongue. Play around with those and see what he actually means by trippingly on the tongue. The next great piece of advice, he says, suit the action to the word and the word to the action. In Chekhov's terms, it would be gesture and action are synonymous. But gesture is a much better word because if I say, Oh, what's the action? I have to play the action. You still hear and you, you try and do that. But if you say, I play the gesture, what is the gesture? Is the gesture this or that? And now you've got to suit the gesture to the word and the word to the gesture. It couldn't be better advice. It's almost as if Chekhov actually wrote that.